everyone. This is Jennifer Hellman, and I am being joined by a, a return guest because he was nice enough to come on again because I just had such a great conversation with Matthew Palomari and um, talking about shamanic creation in a way. Um, we were discussing um, before we came on about um, you have a movie coming up from a book that you did. Tell us about that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, th- first off, thank you for having me on. I, I've, I've enjoyed the show. Um, it's not quite a movie yet, but my historical novel, Land Without Evil, which is about the first contact between the Jesuits and the Indians in South America, except it is told from the Indian's point of view, and it is all about shamanism, um, was made into a wonderful acrobatic stage show directed by Agent Red and an acrobatic troupe in Austin, Texas called uh, Sky Candy, or as I like to call them, Eye Candy, because they are. Mm -hmm. And um, the making of that show was actually filmed by PBS for an award-winning a series called Arts in Context about collaboration in the arts. And as a result of that, uh, a very dear writer friend of mine was very, very excited, and she contacted a husband and wife uh, producer team in New York. She is an actress, um, and she has South American roots, and so my friend was very excited about uh, having them produce my show. And uh, I sent her, uh, the lady in New York, I sent her a copy of the novel, and I sent her a couple of acts from the show that were on video. And uh, she read the novel and was very, very, very excited. And she said, I don't want to do a show about this. I want to do a film. And she said, uh, we, obviously, in order to get going, we need a uh, script. Is that possible? And I said, yes. And so I've been busting my butt working on it, and I just cracked the uh, third or fourth draft this morning. Yeah, fourth draft I think I'm on now. That's that's amazing. Um, what was? How did you get the original idea for this? I mean, were you in South America, and the idea came to do this? Well, I, I've been going to South America for 15 years, and mostly into the jungle, but... Prior to that, um, I had been researching shamanism on my own, and I took an anthropology course. Uh, I was going for my degree, and I realized that all of the things that I was learning in the anthropology course were things I had been researching on my own. And I had a very wonderful connection with my professor. And then the next semester, he was teaching an honors course, and it was called... uh, a Forest of Symbols, Orientation and Meaning to South American Indian Religions. And, of course, I was hooked. Mm -hmm. And so um, there was a really amazing book called Ikanchu's Drum, which was written by Lawrence Sullivan, who was the uh, director of religious studies at Harvard University. I'm not sure if he's still there now or not. But I read about the story of the Guarani Indians uh, of South America and their search for the mythical land without evil, and I was totally hooked. And I was blown away that nobody had written the story yet. So I spent two and a half years extensively researching it, and then I spent uh, 15 months writing the first draft um, in in an insane creative splurge, for lack of better words. So with that, as you say that, I'm going, okay, a creative splurge. Do you feel like the shamanic practice helps you connect to your muse, out of lack of of another word, for that creative insight and passion to produce your writings? Yes. Um, I I, I will qualify that. Um, First off, I want to say that I do not consider myself a genius in any way, shape, or form. But having said that, they had done uh, a survey of all the geniuses some years back and to find out 
the one thing that they all had in common. And the one thing that they all had in common is that every one of them said, it wasn't me. So what I have learned through my path and my research and my uh, experiences is that you can find a point in your creativity where I believe you can literally sort of uh, put your ego aside and uh, really let it flow through you. And, and I think there's a very delicate point of balance where you can uh, let things come through. I, uh, I've recently seen your uh, soon-to-be-published uh, poetry book, Jennifer, and that, uh, to me, came from the same wellspring. And I think you could even say uh, it, it was channels. Mm -hmm. And um, I have a, diff, a short, funny little story, and, and that is that when the the novel, my novel came out, I literally finished it in a fever, and I was uh, working and working, and then the final three days or so, I was in a fever, and I would write, say, three pages in, in my bed, and then I would pass out for a few hours, and I'd wake up, and I would write more on my laptop, and when I finally finished, um, and like the last hundred pages were done in a matter of days in this whole creative, literal fever, and when I finished... I got out of bed, and my laptop was beside my bed, and then there was a pile of stuff on my dining room table. There was a pile of stuff by my uh, living room couch, and there was a pile of stuff on my desk in the office. And I had been going around the house like this, and my fingers were sore and aching and my joints and everything else. And I was like, wow, like, where have I been? I was like, it was like literally... Mm -hmm. like that. So um, I got interviewed by the newspaper here in San Diego, and I told them that I felt like I was possessed when I finished the novel. And so what they wrote in the newspaper, in the article, was that I was possessed when I finished it. And at the time, I had a high-level management uh, job in corporate America, and so I got really nervous because that didn't look good. So I tracked down the, uh, the founder, CEO of the company, and I gave him a copy of the book, and he loved it, and so I was safe. But it was a mm -hmm. whole really bizarre experience. And, and it does that. I mean, I had valley fever where the doctor said, just sleep for six months. So I understand about that fever. And literally, um, I wrote so much poetry and so much. And the interesting thing, during that time, I was doing some shamanic connection with animals, and one of them was bear. Talk about a perfect one for hibernation. Um, and it was interesting that I literally felt possessed by a bear, and I went hunting out in the desert, and I'm picking fruit off of cactus and eating it like I was a bear. Mm -hmm. um, so it's very interesting once you get connected to the potential mm -hmm. of everything that is possible. It just takes you to really a whole different place of, of creation. And yeah. um, and I find my poetry a lot of times, I'll write a poem and it's like, ew. But if I get that vibration, that very high vibration, mm -hmm. um, and a lot of times music will bring it yeah. on or a poem, uh, just a single line that somebody writes will just click me into that space yeah. and I just take off um, yes. and it is a more sensual part of me that mm -hmm. is truly the essence of love that comes through me at least for me mm -hmm. do you find yourself um, kind of wondering why you can't be in that space all the time well you know um, I've been writing for over 30 years now and so um, I can pretty much write on demand, although sometimes I feel like the energy isn't right. Like yesterday I had kind of a chaotic day. I had a lot of interruptions and emails and people, and there were a few little dramas going on around me. Um, and so I just said, you know what, the energy's not right today. I'm just not going to do it. But more often than not, I can call it up uh, on demand. And uh, interestingly enough, when I wrote um, um, most of – uh, Land Without Evil, um, I was listening to Carlos Santana, 
which has the whole wonderful Latin percussion and rhythm, and, and um, there's not uh, that many vocals in it. So it's instrumental, and it, it really worked for me. Uh, another thing about music, slightly off topic, but not really, is um, I've been working with, uh, you know, shamans and stuff in South America now for about 15 years, and I've worked with uh, a number of different uh, plants in the jungle, and of uh, the primary one that I've worked with is ayahuasca, which is a combination of two plants. And it puts you into a visionary state. And what they say in the lore of the jungle is that um, ayahuasca is the river and that the songs and the icaros and the incanta incant excuse me, incantations that the shamans do are the boats that carry you along the river. And I just love that metaphor. Um, I also want to add something else about, because uh, we're talking about fever dreams and things like that. Uh, many, many cultures and, and many traditions of shamanism, there are a number of ways to reach a visionary state. I always make the joke that, uh, you know, Christians maybe don't like me, but, uh, you know, in, in the Bible they say that Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights and saw, he went to the desert and saw God. Mm -hmm. And, of course, uh, a shaman would say, or anybody, anybody goes into the desert for 40 days and 40 nights and fasts, they survive. I guarantee you they'll be talking to God, too. Right. And, you know, and so there are a number of ways to reach visionary states. There's, there's fasting, there's dancing, there's mm -hmm. fever, and all those things. And it's interesting we're having this discussion right now because I just cracked open this, this you know, next revision of my screenplay. And the opening of the story as the protagonist, the shaman, he gets a fever and he goes into a fever dream and gets his visions. So it's a big part of shamanic tradition is, is my point. And there are a number of ways yeah. to do it. Yeah. So I, I kind of wanted to make that point because it seems relevant at the moment. It is. Um, it is um, really a really powerful time right now for creative energy to come out, and I think that's one reason why I did want to have you back on because the conversation is, I want to say the potential and the, the energy is so huge with you. You have this magic about you that you. you're, you're, hey, thank you. Um, it, it, it was interesting, it's like you gave me such a calling card. It's like almost a light tap on the shoulder of remembering yesterday when I asked you to be on the show and you said thankful for I, I'm help you know I'm here for service you know for service and I was just like oh yeah that's right we are <laughs> and it's just yeah. like it was for some reason I know that but every once in a while we do get wrapped up in the physical and wanting to get things done that we forget the magic Mm -hmm. And the creation that we are part of. Mm -hmm. What Tremendous. do you have any hints of how to make sure? Is it meditation? Is it just centering? Um, is it diet, fasting? Is there anything that really helps you stay centered in understanding? Yes, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna go off on a riff here for a bit. So uh, please do. Thank you. Be bear with me. <laughs> <laughs> We're taking off. Fasten your seatbelts. Okay. Um, <laughs> so here, here's the thing. There are numerous paths. I mean, I've meditated for over 30 years. I don't meditate as uh, religiously as I used to because other things have happened and my path has progressed. And so whoever an individual is on their path is what's going to work for them. I mean, I've done all this extensive work with the visionary plants because that is my path. But that is not for everybody, and not everybody needs it. Now, there's, there's uh, visions, there's dreaming, and all of that. And what I've discovered for me personally is uh, in indigenous cultures, there is visionary states, there's dreaming, there's waking. Um, and in our Western culture, we tend to separate those, but in indigenous cultures, they're really all one and the same. They're just different parts of the path. And if you think about life, um, even though it all seems very solid, three-dimensional reality, it's all temporary because we're all going to leave this place at some point. Right. Um, you know, and move forward. So, you know, 
Row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 merrily. Life is but a dream. Mm -hmm. So what I've discovered in my research is that um, I've been into numerous intense visionary states, and I've done uh, a tremendous amount of dream work where I've had some of the most profound experiences of my life. And when I worked more and more, especially doing the extended uh, jungle diets, I found that the more I've embraced those, for lack of better words, those other realities, that the dreaming started to come into my waking life and my waking life started to go into my dreaming and the dreaming and the waking started going into my visionary experiences and they all started to flow together. And, and, and in, in mm -hmm. essence, what happened is, is the magic of the dreaming and the visionary states started to come into my regular everyday life. And then things became extra magic and extra bright. Now, again, my path has been working with the plants, but you, uh, you could achieve this depending on where any individual is at in their growth. Hey, the, I guess the, the powers that be said, hey, you're out of there. <laughs> it's, it's the Twilight Zone. He That's played the right Twilight Zone. That. Yeah. And you can go over as long as you need to today because I'm in that kind of a mood. Hey. Okie dokie. I'm, uh, I don't know where I got cut off. Um, basically, I think you were on and I was cut off. So um, it, it was interesting that you were talking about the dreams and the power of them and how they blend so well into your present day. Because literally at, at 13, I had a dream that lasted a month, and literally it was metaphorically 13 years of my life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um. And through the, the years, um, the metaphors took on different perspectives right. and perceptions. And it, so it kind of added to, um, and the word that comes to mind, the drama of, of what I was living. And it, it's very interesting, the power of that dream. Yes. It, it was so lucid and um, so real to me. Even at 13, I said, wow, maybe I should write this down. Did I? Um, no. Um, but it comes back to me in bits and pieces of, okay, look at this part of your dream and the metaphors it's showing you. What's another perspective you can see it uh, through it? Yes. Of, and it was really a great way of learning about myself and the people in my life and what they were experiencing because when they showed it they showed it from their perspective looking at me so i became the witness yeah, so that witness is good yeah you know and that's the part that i think um kind of blew me away is the fact that i could be the witness and actually know i am the witness yeah i, I could give you a riff on that if you'd like please do uh, it ties in with what you had to say before uh, first off, I, I'm, I want to give myself a little sideways plug because um, in my memoir, uh, Spirit Matters, I had the most profound dream experience of my life. I had a few of them, but the most profound in the jungle tied in with my visions, which uh, was very amazing and profound. I'm going to leave it at that. If anybody wants to know, sorry, you got to buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> and what but, was the name of the book? Uh, One more time. Spirit, yes, yeah, Spirit matters um and it's on amazon and and every, you know on my website and uh you know it can be found but um this is the thing i believe in fact i was kind of to get to this before we got cut off having to do with what you're calling the witness which i love the uh in fact this is back to where i was before i got cut off now i'm thinking about it so there is in in shamanism there is uh, things that you do are uh, big things in your life in different areas are called a bid for power. And you are actually, if you're truly pursuing the shamanic path, then you are on the power path. And the power path has to do with uh, mastering energy. And it means mastering energy um, personally you know, physically, mentally, emotionally, intellectually, all of those things, it's mastering those energies. And, of course, emotions are the hardest to master because they're the quickest. But we are all, so we, we come into the world and we are all, um, we come in sort of, 
for lack of better words, kind of like a blank slate, you know, tabula rasa. And we look and we experience and we feel the energies of everyone around us who's in our immediate life. And, of course, how do we learn? We copy people. We empathize with them. We feel, the, we, we feel them, especially the bond between uh, mother and child. You know, I mean, it's, it's literally physically attached prior to birth and then in birth. The, the emotional connection between a mother and a child is very, very uh, intense and powerful. And the child can feel things the mother's feeling. Uh, I, I even believe, uh, you know, telepathically, it's that powerful. Mm-hmm. So we start off in the beginning of our lives uh, being reflective. We, we reflect uh, everything we learn. How does this person deal with that situation? We watch and we feel and we, you know, we observe it on different levels and then we emulate it because that's how we're learning. Those are the, everybody around us is, uh, in essence, teaching us. But the problem is, well, it's not really a problem. We have to develop, that's how we develop our personality and our ego. But people come up with strategies to deal with situations in their life because they really don't know any better way and they learn from the people around them who don't necessarily know a better way. So we become, in the first parts of our life, we become reflective. And um, everybody around us, you know, uh, we become sort of a mirror to them. That's why, you know, uh, to sound like a wise guy, kids can sometimes be the best revenge on their parents because they're little mirrors and kids are brutally honest. So we go through that part of our life building a personality, which is our ego. Now, we are the ones that built it. But we end up identifying with it and thinking that we are our ego. But in essence, we are not our ego. We are the creators of our ego. But we become so identified with it that we believe that we are our ego. But we are not. So if you really pursue the path with an open heart and you look intensely, at some point in your life, you'll come to the realization that these things are happening and you'll realize that the people around you are mirrors. And there are aspects of yourself, sub-personalities, that have been repressed and abandoned. And this is what becomes um, your shadow. And your shadow comes out when you least expect it. And when you're upset, you project it onto other people. And if anybody is brutally honest with themselves, they'll come to realize that everybody in their life who drives them the most crazy, who aggravates them, who really infuriates them the most, is their shadow it's an aspect of their shadow and that's that mirror and of course we don't want to see that so the shadow aspect that subpersonality is repressed and when it starts to come out it's really pissed off because it has been abandoned so one of the key uh, modes of the shamanic path is to seek out these subpersonalities and it is often a very very terrifying experience because it's all the things that we don't want to see in ourselves but when you have these sub personalities and you're doing all these different things to suppress them you have in essence what is called uh, energy leaks and the sub personalities are not only abandoned um, alone but some of them work together uh, and many of them work together in different ways almost like a, I like to think of it as a gang and they work together in different ways, and they'll actually, even though they're trying to do you good, they will do your undoing. So what will happen is, is you'll start to discover these subpersonalities, and over time, if you have the, uh, the, the fortitude um, and the bravery to, to uh, actually bring them back to yourself, then all of these little energy leaks that you have had start to come back to yourself, and they start to gather around into what I like to call witness consciousness, which you just mentioned a little while ago. Mm-hmm. And then this witness consciousness starts to be more higher self-directed, and then you become less of a reflector uh, and more of a uh, transmitter. You actually go from being more lunar to more solar. And if you're doing your work right and you grow older, then you become more of a uh, a positive mirror for people and you become more higher centered and your witness consciousness becomes stronger and stronger 
and you become aware of it. And even though, you know, I can be going through an experience in life and I watch my little subpersonalities going nuts and, and I, I, I laugh, not these days now I laugh at myself. I go, oh, really? And I don't give it any energy. So, you know, you can get lost in those things and you can lose your temper and do things you regret later because you're caught up in the emotion. Mm-hmm. Or you can grow in awareness into this witness consciousness and just watch it go by but not act on it and not give it the energy. And over time they quiet down. And they start to become more, the whole band starts to sing more of the same tune. And you become more integrated and you become more whole and you start to regain your personal power. And that's when things start to really happen. Um, it, it's, I mean, it sounds complicated on some levels and it sounds simple on some levels. But you really have to pay attention because there are dangers all along the way mm-hmm. of your ego uh, getting out of control. I've seen people learn a few things. And then they suddenly think they've got it because they've been fooled by their ego. And then they think that they're a guru or they, they know it all. And then they're off and then they, they end up uh, losing the trail. And you really need to be self-aware. And um, self-awareness and cultivating awareness, you know, comes from many things, including meditation, which is a great practice. Um, Go ahead. No, I was just... It's hard to, I mean, there isn't a set number of sub-personalities, correct? No, that's correct, and everybody is different. So it's, at least I know I'm still working on on getting over some of mine. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. Got in touch with one yesterday. Um, And after I I had my little tantrum, I was laughing hysterically at myself. Perfect. Um, but I did give it a little bit of an energy, but then it's like, okay, why am I going there? Um, and then I went back to center. It's almost like I needed that little bit of a release. Mm-hmm. And then I went back to center. Um, yeah. And it's, it is very interesting. Is there any way that you can really help somebody understand, you know, as soon as there's peace in their, their, centered all the time is that when they know that they've really gotten in touch with all their sub personalities or can one sneak in there they're I mean, always yeah they're always trying to sneak in even when you least expect it they'll try to sneak in i always love to say that you never arrive anybody who thinks they've arrived are delusional i'm, I'm i haven't arrived it's never ending but it does get easier and um i'm and you know It's kind of a joke. There's all these voices in my head, and I'm starting to know which ones to listen to. And the key, truly, in all of this is how does it make you feel? Because when you feel that that is the energy, if I'm upset or tweaked or pissed off, I stop myself and I go, whoa, whoa, what's going on here? Where is this coming from? And I dig down and find out where it comes from. And much of it even goes back to, to birth. Um, you know, there is the whole birth thing that, that happens, the, the sort of uh, original trauma of, of coming into this world. Um, I want to mention really quick two, two really great books um, that aren't mine, so I'm not plugging myself here. But there is one called The Dark Side of the Light Chasers by Debbie Ford. And it really simplifies, it's a, it's, it's a simplified um, model to show how to look for the subpersonalities. And, and, in, and in that book, she actually gives them names, you know, like Delusional Debbie or Mental Matt or you mm-hmm. know, Pissed Off Paul. They all have names. And then um, if anybody wants to explore it in much further depth, um, I worked with a gentleman by the name of Jose Stevens and his uh, wife, uh, Lena, and they have the Power Path School of Shamanism. And Jose has written a number of books, but the one I've probably bought tons of copies and doing it away, it's called uh, Transforming Your Dragons, How to Turn Your Fear Patterns into Power. And it's Jose Stevens, Ph.D., and um, it actually really gets into depth about the subpersonalities and the and the sort of the the patterns and the, um, for lack of better words, uh, classifications that they fall into. 
And it really helps you to put a face on them. And once you can put a face on them, you start to see them in action. And even when you catch them initially, they'll keep coming back and they'll keep testing you in different ways. And so there's a process that you go through where initially you're just swept up in it and you don't even know what happened. And then you're in the middle of the madness and you catch yourself in the middle of the madness. You go, oh. Oh, oh, look what happened. Jeez, I've been crazy now for the past five minutes. And it kind of sounds like what you just did yesterday, actually. Right. You know, then the, that happens a few times. And then as more time passes, you start to see it coming. And you can see it coming. And, you, and in your mind, you can watch it unfold. And you can even let it unfold in your mind. But you don't act on it. And you don't give it energy. And it passes quickly. And then over more time, it just becomes a peep. And you see it for what it is. And you, you, you catch it right away. Um, now, tying in with what I was saying about uh, the energies and how they feel, I want to mention something that was really great that you just said a little bit ago, and that has to do with the fact that you caught yourself in the middle of all this craziness, and then you laughed. Now, laughter is amazingly powerful medicine on numerous levels. It's even been proven physiologically. And actually, uh, laughter and a bit of humor is a big part of, part of the uh, shamanic tradition. That's where uh, coyote comes in quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, trickster and laughing, and you can't, regardless of all the stuff that goes on, you just can't take yourself too seriously. Because if you take yourself too, uh, too seriously, you're getting caught up in the ego. So laughter is an amazingly powerful medicine and if you think about it what is what is laughter energetically it's a, it's, it's it's kind of a joy and it's a release and it's it, it, wonderfully it, liberating very much so yeah and it so, really does get yourself out of yourself absolutely absolutely when I, i've been in the deepest depths of my uh, darkness and i catch myself and then i'm all you know and i get all wrapped up in this you know martyrdom and oh you know poor me, and all that stuff, and I catch myself, and I go, look at what you're doing, and I start to laugh, and boom, it just blows it all out of the water, there's just, just you know, no place for all that morbid gloom and doom, self-pity, you know, stuff, lower energy, basically. Right, the, the other thing I find is, if I, I get into that dark space, and then I, I say something that's like a question, and they say, well, what about that? It's like, uh, another essence of me is like questioning, like almost coaching myself. Yeah. And what are you going to do about it? This yeah. is the way you're feeling, but only you can change it. You know that. How are you going to do that? And that's right. generally when I start laughing and saying, well, you tell me. I need yeah. suggestions because obviously I'm getting kind of caught up with this. And it, it's almost like a brainstorming within myself of mm -hmm. ways to move forward. Right. Right. That's that's true. I and um, what I've seen on my path is that people, and I was this way myself and have tendencies toward it, but people tend to get caught up in their heads. Mm -hmm. And we've all been taught to solve our problems with our heads. But what happens, which was really, really severely bad with me in my younger years, is that I was so caught up in my head that I lost touch with my heart which means I lost touch with my, my feelings and my emotions. And I've seen people do deep shamanic work, and the intellectuals who are real control freaks are the ones who have had the worst times because they're trying to control, and they're trying to control with their minds. And in essence, at times when those things are happening, what you have to do is what you just said a little bit ago, which is surrender. Right. And then when you surrender, you start to find freedom. And so... Um, in, in the uh, shamanic path, you start to learn to follow your heart, which is actually superior to your mind. As, as you know, being uh, not only a woman but a seeking woman, that your intuition is really more powerful than your intellect. Mm -hmm. You know, you can sit there and figure things out with your, your intellectual mind and it's all sort of serialized and this and that and structured and logical and all that but uh, you can you can in a flash of intuition you can real, realize 27 things in that same moment and realize they're all the same and have that flash of wonderful insight 
And that comes from intuition, which comes from the heart, which in shamanism is actually the far superior organ to the brain. So we as humans kind of have it all bass backwards, uh, especially in, in, you know, Western scientific culture. Um, there, there's a whole other thing that goes on, uh, and you may have heard me say this before, but the, the, and this, this ties in with what I teach in my uh, shamanic story structure class, and, and that is that uh, the heart is the center of your universe. And there is uh, the Temple of Man in Luxor, Egypt, which is a mathematical representation of the human body and the cosmos. In fact, it's called the Temple of Anthropocosmic Man. And your heart is the center, and then all your other organs and parts of you are the things that revolve around the center of this universe. But when you are in tune with your heart, then the heart is the sun of your universe, and that sun of your universe is connected to the sun above us that gives us life unconditionally, and that sun is connected to another sun, to another, to another one, all the way back to source. Mm -hmm. So when you start to tune into that and you, in essence, put your brain aside and put your mind aside and put your ego aside and connect to that, then you're starting to really tune in. And there's a wonderful uh, poem by Rumi. Uh, no, I'm sorry, it's not Rumi. I believe it's Hafez. And it says, um, I'm probably messing up a little bit, but it says, uh, even after all this time, the sun never once says to the earth, you owe me. Mm -hmm. Look what happens with a love like that. It lights up the whole sky. I think that pegs it. It really does. And and that's something that um, that humans tend to forget. Absolutely. And that was like that tap on the shoulder for me from you yesterday. I'm here in service. And it's like, yes, we all are. Um, and it, it was um, such a blessing, and it's it's very interesting that the times and the energy right now are all about going through that shadow, finding all those sub personalities, and they're being reflected in the media and the and the government, and it really is like a huge transformation or initiation in some ways um, overall that everybody's going through and there's quite a few people that have a slight clue of what's going on which is helping a lot of people go through but it is an interesting time that uh, of talking about um the shamanic process and practice because it really is i don't want to say it's just coming back in favor that a lot of people are doing it but it really is bringing us back to our heart and yes. understanding that there is a simple way of living and being and being your high potential. And it's just centering yourself within the heart and understanding your intuition really has the plan down really well. And it's when you try and, and create something that's really off. It's not that, at least for me, I don't think the heart wants you not to have those adventures and go off center a little bit just to find yourself back to center. But it, it's so much simpler if you just say, okay, today I'm going to have fun. Yes. Fun is, fun is like, fun is probably one of the primary, you know, uh, cosmic principles for lack of a better word. You really got to lighten up, you know. And 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 it's interesting because when I was doing a lot of the shamanic work, coyote was around me so strong. Oh yeah. Um, I literally had coyotes outside my window, oh, yeah. um, literally, and staring at me. And I actually had this this one that was a pup, and I watched her grow up. And she was very skittish. She would always look up like she was afraid of a bird attacking her. Mm -hmm. um, and I always thought, well, maybe she's afraid of that two-by-four because I often looked at her and thought of Wiley E. Coyote um, mm -hmm. because that's the way she was waiting for that bomb to blow up. Right. Um, but if I see Coyote, it's like, okay, time to laugh, time to have fun, time to get over myself and um, regroup. 
Yeah. And that's the, the one thing that I think really helped me through my processes is the fact that I connected so strongly with the animals because they were like physically around me. And I've had some that literally came to me in spirit. There was just no way physically they could be there. But yet I had this visitation with them oh, right yeah. on. And, and it's, it's, I'm very grateful for those moments of connection because if you really understand the animals and they they are some of the greatest teacher. Nature is the best teacher. That's why I love the jungle so much because you're immersed in it and you are correct. And when you start to become more aware and your energy starts to become more, more centered, as you've been saying, and more grounded, you will see animals will respond to you differently. Mm-hmm. I've had some very, 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 very powerful animal experiences. Um, even just uh, about a year or two ago, I was in a place doing some shamanic work, and nobody was around, and it was at dusk, and this fox came. He came out. I mean, this really happened. And I looked at him, and he looked at me, and, I, and what I realized is when you connect with animals in, in this kind of a way, it has to be on their terms. So I just slowly squatted a little bit and looked at him and kind of put out the energy. And I'll be damned if he didn't come over to me. And then he rubbed himself up back and forth across my legs the way a cat does. Right. And, and part of me wanted to pat him, but I knew if I pat him, it would freak him out. And it had to be on his terms. So he just, he just rubbed against me for like a minute. It was just really amazing. And then he went off about 10 feet and was just looking at me like, how do you like that? You know? <laughs> Very powerful. And, I, and you know, I've had yeah you know, other experiences like that with birds, particularly hummingbirds. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So and, and that's uh, go on. Well, like I was gonna say that is another aspect of reality reflecting back to you that when you become more aware and your energy becomes uh, more grounded and, and steady, then the animals will sense that and they'll start to reflect back to you different things, and that's where totems really come in, and totems and omens and those kind of things you always hear about in shamanism gets reflected back to you uh, from the world around you because the animals have uh, far more awareness than most people give them credit for. Definitely. Um, I had a similar um, situation, though I was inside my house and and three bobcats, baby bobcats, were playing and literally there was a screen between us and we were almost nose to nose. Mm Mm-hmm. And it, it, it was just so powerful, and they were playful. And it's just like, okay, I know the bobcat energy, which is all about secrets. And they can teach you the secret language of the universe if they're open to it, but they know how to respect those secrets. So um, I know that's one of my totems and definitely lessons for me. Um, so I, I, I just recently saw another bobcat, and it's just like, okay. I know it's it's time to go more within myself because the universe is opening up a, another avenue for me to learn from. Um, <clears throat> so, in I mean, there's a, a wonderful book by Ted Andrews called yep. um, Animal Spirit, and yep. he has another one. Do you remember the name of the other book? I just, you know what? I just saw it like two days ago. Um, uh, his work is brilliant. Um, yeah. I actually took a class with him. Oh, nice. Um, yes. And then I had him on my show, and then within six months after having him on my show, he died. Oh, so, wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah um, and talk about, I mean, he has the energy of a leprechaun. I mean, he is a natural spirit, and he just was a really beautiful soul to kind of, bring out the animal energy. So I, I, I highly recommend if you're interested in um, finding out more about your animal spirits, just check really any of Ted Andrews' yep. books. He is an amazing writer and teacher. His his website's still up with a lot of information. I, I, he must have like 15 to 20 books. Yeah. Uh, Amazing. He goes even into the mystical animals like 
unicorns and dragons and fairies and all those beautiful energies and connecting with trees and flowers and plants and what they're trying to tell you. And it, it's, it was interesting how I kept seeing gardenias. Really powerful. And I looked in the book and, and it's a great essence to open up your telepathic abilities. And it's just those little simple things that you pay attention to what is coming to you. That's and, awareness. And, and that's, it's magic. It's just like, oh, I get it. I get it. You know? Yeah. yeah you know, um, my biggest, my biggest uh, totem, my primary totem at, for some years now has been the hummingbird which, you know, is my email is picaflora, which is Spanish. Uh, Picar is to bite and flora is flower, so it's picaflora. And there's a number of songs in the Amazon about picaflora. And I had a, 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 a friend tell me that uh, hummingbirds were the nerve endings of God, and I thought, wow, I love that. And um, the other animals are really kind of emissaries. As a matter of fact, the, one of the primary themes in this novel, Land Without Evil, that I'm adapting into a screenplay, the main character, uh, his name is Avatape, which means the messenger bird of Tupa, which is a, you know, kind of a nature deity. And his whole quest is to try to find the song of Tupa in order to connect to spirit and, 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 and find his guidance. And so it, it is, it is uh, prevalent throughout you know, worldwide cultures and, and, and shamanism, and when mm -hmm. you're really aware and really paying attention, you do notice those things. Uh, unfortunately, in our contemporary society, where we're so caught up on our computers and our buildings and our, you know, cities, that uh, most of us have uh, lost touch with that. Well, it, it, a couple things. Hummingbird is the joy of life. Mm -hmm. What a beautiful t totem to have. Oh, yeah. Um, and the other thing that I find very interesting is a lot of animals are coming into the cities now. And, and partly because we've gone over into their territory and they're losing territory to right. live. Right. But it's interesting that they're making themselves known. Yeah. They're like, hey, wake up, you bozos. <laughs> and, 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 and you hear of the animals and what they're going through. And it's like, that's the thing that breaks my heart is the way that humanity is treating nature. And, and that's something that really needs to change quite quickly or else we are going to go too far, um, out of whack. The other thing that's interesting is, um, species that were one time thought to be extinct are coming back. That's wonderful. And it, it, it's just like, okay, time for the message to come back. Yeah. Um, so with the process now of, let's say you're, you're opening yourself up to your guidance and to nature and all, um, do you have some tips on how to use that for the creative process? Yeah, um, let me, let me, I'll, I'll see if I, I'm going to start with my own experience and then see if I can bring it into perspective for, for, um, all of your listeners. One of the things when I go into the jungle and I'm isolated in the jungle on a very restricted diet, it's an ancient, it's a prehistoric shamanic diet. And when you're on it for a period of days and you're working with all these different plants, or as the shamans would say, working with all these different plant spirits, then um, what happens over the period of days, okay, you're mostly by yourself and they bring you your food. And so you have no regular routines. And so you could be uh, up all night, sleep half the day. And over the days, as time goes past, there's, you get more physically, uh, physically weaker and your dreams and other things become more vivid. And so, in essence, what happens is the boundaries between your subconscious and your conscious really start to blur, and your subconscious rises up. So if you have uh, subpersonalities, which in other older cultures they would even call personal demons, um, they rise up and you have to deal with them. 
And then your awareness, the more you deal with those energies and the more integrated you become, the more your awareness expands and the more connected you become with your environment. And I've actually been to the point where I was laying there with my eyes closed and I would think of somebody and then I would sit up and about 10 seconds later they'd come walking over the hill. And I didn't hear them because the jungle is pretty loud. So the more you uh, kind of surrender and you really tune in with your awareness to nature and spend time in nature as much as you possibly can, you will be inspired. And, in fact, there's a, there's a whole uh, philosophy of um, having three bodies. There's the physical body, the mental body, and the emotional body, which are uh, translated like in the Inca tradition. There is the upper sky pacha, which is represented by the condor, which is represented of love, which is kind of a pink rose color. The middle ground is the jaguar or the puma, which is power, which is mm -hmm. kind of an uh, electric blue. And the lower world is gold, represented by the serpent, which is wisdom. So there's love, power, and wisdom, which is truth, love, and energy. And um, we all tend to react with one part of ourselves than the other. Like males tend to react first uh, intellectually and then maybe emotionally and then physically, or they may act physically, then intellectually, then emotionally. They, they never always in sync. And women tend to be emotional first. And then, you know, these are generalizations, but the, the three bodies are never quite acting in concert. So um, if you get stuck, like like what I was doing this and didn't realize it for, for years, but when you get stuck, if you're writing in your creative process and you're stuck, Mm-hmm then what you do is you, you, you get up and stop what you're doing and go out and you take a walk. And you shift your energy from your intellectual body. And you, you may even be having been going from your intellectual into your emotional body because you're freaking out because you're not writing. But if you just get up and you walk in nature, if you're in a lucky position such as myself, you can walk by the ocean where you have all that wonderful energy. But you can walk the trees, the plants, and immerse yourself in those energies you will get past your writer's block, I guarantee it, or any other problem solving you're trying to have. Mm -hmm. And it, So it's learning to use and be aware of those energies and then uh, immerse yourself and surrender to them and use them to free yourself and shift your uh, whole thing of, you know, responding with one and then the other kind of a thing, and you become more unified. And, of course, the ultimate goal is to be able to respond with all of them at once. Then you're in the groove, but it's not an easy groove to find. But if you move about, it's amazing the things that can happen in terms of uh, freeing your creativity, especially when you're moving about in nature and just immersing yourself in all those energies. You know, I mean, literally stop and smell the flowers, feel the breeze, whatever it happens to be, even the trees. You can communicate with all of it. Uh, there's gifts there. Yes. And another thing I do is just take a break, turn on some, some music and dance. That's it. Right into your moving body. Yeah, perfect. Um, and and it really, and each song, each, you know, tempo has a different creative energy that comes out. It's it's almost like the many voices within me. It just depends on the music I pick, and that's the voice that comes out to talk. Um, so it's, it's very much... Um, it's great just to move the energy because if you get stuck in anything, moving your body, exercise is great. Um, yoga is great. Yep. Um, but it really helps the, the creative process in, in honing and owning your voice of the creative energy that's within you. Yes, I agree. You are, you are, the, you are the vehicle and the channel. You are indeed the path of manifestation for uh, creative energy. Yeah. And, and that's beautiful. Now, I'm going to ask you, uh, we can continue talking, or this really is a great time to take a break?